In this video on dealing with interference, we're going to look at the ferrite materials which can be used to produce background noise in the shack. But first, to help explain the effectiveness of ferrite devices, we're going to use what's known as a spectrum analyzer and a checking generator. You don't need one in order to solve noise problems, but here we're going to use one to show you what's going on with ferrites. A spectrum analyzer sweeps the radio spectrum from a low frequency, in this case just 500 kilohertz, to an upper frequency at the moment set to 100 megahertz, and everywhere in between. It shows what activity is happening on this part of the spectrum. Just to show that point, I've got a little handheld here set to 6 meters. And you can see a small spike on the screen which is consistent with that part of the band. To give a better perspective of where this fits in on the HF bands, I've got an LED lamp here. This is a fairly noisy unit which disrupts HF up to about 15 or 20 megahertz. When I turn it on, it makes quite a lot of noise. You can see down here on the left hand side of the screen, it, there's a lot of activity and that's what we're hearing on the radio at the moment. Today we're not going to use a spectrum analyzer just as a receiver, we're going to use its tracking generator feature which will allow us to show what's happening with the ferrite devices. Here the spectrum analyzer has its receiver input. This is where it's listening when it's trying to plot on the screen. On this side we have a tracking generator output which is a sweeping frequency at a very high rate that goes between the same two frequencies that are on the screen. The result is we get a baseline of activity across the spectrum. So here I'm coupling the tracking generator to the spectrum analyzer and I'm going to activate it. Okay, we've now set up this machine with the tracking generator output running between roughly 0 and 200 megahertz. On this side we're receiving between 0 and 200 megahertz and we have a flat line which represents the resistance of this conductor at those frequencies. So it's been adjusted or normalized to be a flat line to compensate for any stray uh, values of capacitance around the, the workshop here. So we're going to add a little bit of ferrite material. Here's a ferrite clamp. So now we have a curve on the screen. That curve over this frequency range is the characteristic curve of that ferrite clamp. If I try a different ferrite clamp, I'll get a different curve. If it's a larger one, I'll have more attenuation. If it's a smaller one, I'll have less attenuation. When you buy a ferrite item, if you get any data at all, it's going to be a figure in ohms at one frequency. It doesn't really tell you much, as other ferrites have different resistances at different frequencies. It's quite hard to meaningfully compare between different ferrite items. With this testing arrangement, I'm able to plot the frequency and performance of any ferrite device. I can compare between ferrites. I can see what happens when I use them in different combinations. The trace for this ferrite shows a curve heading in a downwards direction and that shows the amount of attenuation or absorption the ferrite has at any given frequency. The further down, the greater the absorption and it's measured in dB. So I'm interested in five different pieces of information for every ferrite device I test. I'm looking at the minus 3 dB point, the point in frequency where it first drops 3 dB below my baseline. Then I want the top 3 dB point, which will be somewhere up here, the point where it rises up to within 3 dB of the baseline. That effectively gives me the bandwidth of the device. I want to see at what frequency that we have the maximum attenuation, and I want to see how much attenuation we have at that frequency. The last item is the weight. I want to know how heavy each one is, because the mass of the ferrite item is another variable. Okay, so we have one ferrite clamp on the spectrum analyzer and we've got a curve up for it, but what happens when we add another one? I'll just open one up here. The curve has just dropped. Now, if we were to measure that, we would find that it's dropped by another 3 dB, which stands to reason. 3 dB is doubling and we've added an extra ferrite, so we've increased the resistance 
between these two points along our test conductor by two. This is still not a lot of attenuation. Sure, it will knock some noise out, but you're going to need a little bit more than this. And I want to show you some of the effects that we have when we use them in different ways. So we can keep on adding uh, ferrite clamps and slowly build up the attenuation, but that tends to be both bulky and a little bit expensive for the clamps. So I'll take these back off again. Now I'm going to replace our reference wire with a slightly longer wire for this experiment. Okay, we're back to a flat line and I'm going to put our ferrite clamp back on again. That looks a bit like the original curve that we had. But now what I'm going to do is disconnect that wire briefly, put another turn through the ferrite. So we've increased the number of turns through our ferrite core. Okay, so now we've got the extra turn through our ferrite clamp and it has increased the attenuation significantly. There's a, a factor of times four. So for every time we put a turn of wire through the ferrite clamp or ferrite ring, the impedance ratio is the square of the turns ratio and we get a much bigger attenuation factor. Putting that one turn on is the same as having about four ferrites in line. We can go a bit further than that. So I've put an extra turn on. A very big difference. Suddenly our attenuation is almost off the scale on this particular setting. That's a lot more effective just by putting two turns of wire or coax or whatever through our ferrite clamp uh, in terms of how much it's going to attenuate the noise levels going through. That's the number one point I wanted to make here, that it's more valuable to have a large clamp that can fit multiple turns through it rather than having multiple single clamps. Now I want to have a look at some ferrite rings. Let's take this off. I've got a large ferrite ring, similar to the one that's in the QRM kit. Okay, a single turn, a little bit of attenuation, not a lot, but there's a little bit there, so it's doing its job. It's down the bottom end of the spectrum, so that's starting at around about 3 or 4 megahertz. But we've only got the single conductor going through it. The advantage of the ferrite ring is that we can get lots of conductors through it, and we can get lots of large conductors through it, without having to take connectors off and re-terminate them if they're a bit bulky. Let's give this a few more turns. So right here, we're just with two turns in this very large ring, we've got a curve which is almost down to the bottom of the screen. You're starting to see now the effect of a larger mass of a ferrite ring with more than one turn on it. If you want to, you can even increase the effectiveness of ferrite rings by stacking rings, having one on top of the other before you wind the wires around. There's another aspect of ferrite rings which I must point out though. If you're putting a lot of turns on a ferrite ring, it starts to behave like a bit of a transformer and you'll have voltages rising from one side of the ring to the other. So if you've got, say, 10 turns on that ring, the voltage on the output side can be quite high because part of the impedance transformation increases the voltage just like any normal transformer. But that can be fixed if you wind the core the right way. This is a ferrite ring that's been differentially wound. So I'll try and bring it in a bit closer. It's got about five windings on one side, then it crosses over, and then there's five windings the other side. But it's been wound in such a way that the voltage rise effect cancels out, so that on one side the first winding might have built up the voltages, and on the second side of the same number of turns that voltages have been neutralized. So if you've got a lot of wires to put on a ferrite ring, certainly look at differentially winding it like this. Something I haven't spoken about here are ferrite mixes. The ferrite materials are a combination of oxides and epoxies that have been cast into a given shape, which is what gives us our different ferrite devices. But the mixes vary so that they can have different elements that they put in, and that gives it attenuation at different frequencies, depending on what you want to do. 
maybe you're trying to do something at VHF and UHF and you'll use a mixed type that is more effective higher up to the spectrum. Most of the ferrets that we're using for advantage on HF is mix 43. There are other mixes that are very useful at the bottom end of the HF band like mix 31 which gives even more attenuation at the very bottom end but they're quite expensive and a lot of them are special orders from uh, overseas. That's all I wanted to present on this video. I hope you found it interesting. We'll follow up with a little bit more information on reducing noise on the feed lines and actually demonstrate the effects of noise and how RF currents can run over the outsides of coax. If you want a bit more information on what you've seen on this video, we have got a document up on the QRM Guru website which describes what we have been looking at here today. You can read that one at your leisure and you'll learn a bit more about what's going on.